Today I'm doing something a little bit different, which is quite exciting. I'm meeting James from the Paradise Wildlife Park in Hertfordshire to show him around the farm park, talk about the synergies that zoo and farm parks have, and particularly look at sort of animal enrichment and our breeding programs. It's going to meet him now. There he comes, James. Hi, Good to see nice you. To see you. Good Welcome to, to the Cotswold Farm Park. I can't wait to show you around. Thank you for having me. And I'm so excited. Oh, I love going to zoos. Oh, good. I love coming to farm parks and seeing all the animals you've got. James, what we've got is a number of different paddocks in the Cotswold Farm Park with different species in each paddock. Yep. So in here, we've got some of the sort of more ancient breeds. So the Soas here are the most ancient indigenous British breed there are. They've remained unchanged as we domesticated and brought sheep round to the way we want them to be, so big, white, meaty, woolly things. And so these little tiny Soas, they're fully grown, yep. and you can see they're naturally shedding their wool at this time of year. Yeah, so that's just a natural, a natural thing. Process. Like all mammals, or yeah. they live in a temperate climate with molt, yep. that's their molting process. You don't have to do any of the shearing and bits like that. No, we, to, so. we do shear them a little bit later on if they haven't shed their wool, but um, you know, obviously we then chose animals that could hang on to their wool. Yep. And oh, there's one that's a little bit lame there, so we'll have to get her in. And then these are the Highland cattle. And so we've got cows and calves, and then over here, who loves a scratch, if you go around the other side of him, come round to his shoulder, you can give him a, okay, he's a, give him a scratch. He, wow. <laughs> he loves he's it. A, he's a big boy. Yeah, so he really is. So the Highlands, you know, from the Scottish Highlands, very thick skin, hairy coat, and they reckon that the snow will just run off this coat. And there's an under layer as well, a sort of downy underlayer. So really hardy cattle, and not very big as comparison to other cattle breeds. So roughly how much would he weigh? So he would probably weigh 700 kilos. Okay. But a big continental Charolais or Limousin would weigh, a bull would weigh a ton or more. So, um, and in stature, they're quite small. So, so this is the, probably the toughest, hardiest breed that we've got. Yeah. What would be yours? So for us, because we're a bit more wild species, so we've got uh, like battering camels. Uh, so they're designed to come from the Mongolian desert. So they can go to like minus 40 degrees Celsius, uh, up to even plus 40 degrees Celsius. So they'll go through winter period of real big thick uh, coat. They'll sit out in the snow, they're not bothered by that. Uh, and then to the summer months, they molt all that right down to almost just their a fine fur. Uh, just to protect them from the sand. Uh, so yeah, they're probably one of our hardiest creatures that we actually have at, uh, at Paradise Wilder Park. So I was taught Batram with a double hump with a B yep. and a Dromador, is it, yeah. with a D, Dromedary, with just a single? Dromedary with a single hump. Uh, and then you have the Batram camel, yeah, with the two humps. And then uh, recently they've actually realized there's the domesticated Batram camel and the wild Batram camel. They are actually, there is a different lineage between the two. Uh, so where Batram camels over time were brought into captivity, uh, farmed to help people transport stuff around the sandy deserts. They've actually slowly changed to become more of a domestic breed, a bit like some of the guys here. Yeah, and they do milk camels, don't they? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, they'll milk camels. You can get camel milk, camel chocolate. Uh, they'll use their wool as well, so you can get hats, scarves made out of uh, camel wool. Uh, when, and that will just naturally come off them. Uh, it's not shearing or anything like that, it'll just molt off them. But yeah, they'll we'll use that in to make items of clothing. Wow, uh, amazing. Yeah, all different bits of fabric. So yeah, it's very, let's say, very linked in, but with your domestics as well. Sure. So as, as time's gone on. So, you know, all of our animals on the farm would have been wild at one time. Yeah. So, you know, the old auroch cattle that you'd have seen in the cave paintings, the wild sheep that came probably from the mouflon, the wild boar for the pigs. The, the jungle fowl to create the chicken. And so, although these are domesticated, I always carry a stick when I come in with cows and calves and particularly a bull, because yeah. although he's lovely and friendly and quiet, you should never trust them fully. Whereas in your life, your animals aren't domesticated. They're all, I wouldn't want to go in with your lions or your snow leopards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so exact same sort of thing, really. Yeah, big cats, we don't go in with at all. Uh, even though they've been brought up around humans, they still have their wild instincts in them. Uh, so yeah, we don't go in with them at all. But with, say, our zebras, we have lowland tapirs, uh, battering camels, even some of our lemur species as well. 
As exactly the same, they can be nice and friendly like these, they're used to us, but actually you still have to have your wits about them because yeah, they can still be dangerous in their own in their own way. So And for you, I mean it sounds like your job is fascinating. How did you get into that then? So I started off as a, when I was really young. Uh, it was my local zoo. I had a big interest in animals. I went to a lot of local farm parks around by me as well, so I got into my animals uh, and started in by doing a bit of work experience and volunteering. Uh, and just worked my way through really and just fell in love with certain species, started to learn more about them. Uh, I went to an agricultural college uh, to learn your basics about like your, your shearing, your hoof trimming on your cattle and your sheep uh, to then transfer some of them skills in to your exotic breeds as well because actually some of your wild goat species you still have to manage their hooves, giraffe you have to manage their hooves, uh, same with our zebras, same with horses as well. So all, that, all them aspects of it, we, like, we can try transferable skills between it. But. So you don't have a degree in zoology? So I have a, a diploma in uh, zoo management, yeah. yeah. So there's different routes to go down. There's the degree side of things, um, where you can go and get a zoology degree, uh, or there's uh, actually, working in the fi like, actually working in the field and doing uh, diplomas and going into college routes and stuff like that. Wow. So has different aspects that all different people in with different walks of life, because especially animals, there's lots of people out there that might, they go into animals because they might not be academic. So actually there's links into zookeeping through that aspect of it. Um, in the classroom, they might not be very good, but actually, uh, out with the animals, they're complete different nature. You probably see it a lot sure. around here as yeah. well. Yeah, same um, in farming really. Yeah, when people come to the animals, it just, they completely change yeah. Uh, yeah. and make themselves at home compared to actually in a school life. But having said that, to learn all about their diet, their anatomy, what they need as husbandry and their veterinary requirements, you've got to be pretty bright, isn't yeah. it? You, you know, you need to be reasonably academic. Exactly, yeah, so, and it's academic in a different sort of way, so instead of being sitting in that classroom learning it, as you're out there with the animals, you're learning it from the other keepers that have been in the field, probably same here, like farmers, like learning, you're through passing experience. the trade on that through that experience levels, uh, through just actually doing it firsthand, learning it that way is a great way, uh, I find, uh, I found myself and a few other people, and. and just different walks of life will learn different ways, don't they? So, yeah, incredible. Uh, yeah. And just passing on that knowledge that people like yourself have learned, other people have uh, been in their uh, careers for a long period of time, um, can actually pass on to juniors. I've been in it now for about 20 years, so passing that down to junior Since keepers coming through. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, close, 14 is actually when I started. Is it really? Yeah, Amazing. I started at work, yeah. I say, work for us at a young age, just helping clean out Incredible. and sweep. Uh, yeah, so, and then now passing that, like, to get 20 years at that young age, to be able to pass that on to younger, the younger keepers coming through. I say younger, it makes me feel old, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But there would be thousands of young people that would be fascinated in your world and want to follow that career. It's yeah. Interesting to know how you got there. Yeah, exactly. And say it was nice even seeing how you get like to fight that farming aspect. It's a different side of animal keeping. You have your domestic sides, and then you also have the exotic side from our side as well. So it's fantastic. But to see buttes like him is fantastic. Isn't he's he lovely? Huge. Yeah. He's a lovely boy. So that most cattle in the UK have got horns. There are some pole breeds, as you know, with no horns. And um, if you feel his horn, they're warm, you probably already know, right to the tip. So it's only the very end that hasn't got blood vessels in it. Yep. And so that's a living bit of tissue. And, um, and what, are the, what are the horns made out of, just for people that yeah, might not so know? So keratin, so the same as the hoof yep. and same as the hair. And, um, and it's just hardened. And they want, with a highland, you've got their breed characteristics. Yep. So they come all different colours. So red, black, blonde, a chocolatey coloured called dun. So there's a whole range of colours. And with the bulls, they've got obviously thicker and stronger horns than the cow. But they reckon that they should just turn up towards the end. So they are above the eye level is an ideal one. And then this bit on the front is called the docent. That's all his long hair on his forelock. Wow. So the wind and the rain and the snow goes over his face. So when he's up in the Scottish Highlands and it's blizzarding, he just stands against it and braves it up. Yeah, it's not a place you really want to be to it like with, without that, is it, really? And the calves, they're born like little teddy bears, just full of fur. They're absolutely gorgeous. And you, you breed him here, has he been a successful bull? Yeah, he has, he's lovely. We've only had him a few years. We um, replace our males, yeah. so we keep our daughters in the herd, so the heifers we keep in. And when his daughters are coming up to two stroke three, they'll go back to a bull and obviously can't go back to their dad. So we change our bull every two or three years. And it's the same with our rams and our billy goats. And so there's that regular turnaround. Yeah, look, keeping the genetics lines going and bits like that, really. Absolutely. Wow, perfect. Let me show you some other things. Oh, smashing.